Welcome everyone to the 2024 Create Space Public Art Forum keynote address. I'm very excited to be hosting you all today. Thank you for joining. My name is Belinda Owase. I'm the Artist Programs Coordinator with STEPS Public Art. Um, I'm very excited to be hosting this keynote address with our speakers, Christine Liu and Alan Webb. Um, we also have ASL interpretation provided by Christina Morden from Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba. Um, STEPS Public Art is a Canadian charity and social enterprise um, offering services in public art management, hoarding exhibits, cultural planning, and artist capacity building. We run charitable programs that support artists and foster vibrant and inclusive communities. Before we go into this conversation, um, we wish to acknowledge the sacred land on which we operate out of, and some of us are joining from today. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. The territories include the huron wendat Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation. The territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes, taking only what is needed and ensuring the dish is never left empty for others. Today, the meeting place of Te Coronto is the home to a large, active, and diverse urban indigenous community from many nations across Turtle Island. And we're grateful to share ideas and generate creativity on this land today. As a public arts organization, we recognize our privilege in working on stolen and unceded lands and are working to unlearn the colonial structures to move towards reconciliation. In the chat, you will see that we have shared a link to nativeland.ca which is a great starting point to help learn about the traditional indigenous territories we currently reside in, as well as the treaties, communities, and languages. We're grateful for all that those that came before us, and we encourage everyone to learn about the lands that we call home and about the indigenous communities that we share this land with today. Again, we have ASL interpretation provided by Christina, who spotlighted, but um, for easy access, feel free to also pin them to your screen. Uh, we also have closed captioning available, so please see the CC icon on your Zoom toolbar. Um, and please keep your questions to the end while we have some time for questions, um, but also feel free to drop them in the chat. And without further ado, I'm very excited to be introducing Lou Webb and our speakers, Christine Lou and Alan Webb. Um, and I'll just, yeah, pass it on to you to introduce yourself. And I'm excited for this conversation, so thank you. Hi, thank you, Belinda uh, and Christina for your work today and welcome everyone. It's amazing to have uh, so many people here online. Uh, we're coming to you from Ottawa, which is the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Uh, typically our home base is in Toronto. Um, but we're here on a, on a project, which we'll touch on probably a little bit later. But without further ado, we can launch in um, to our presentation. And we'll play from the start. Okay, everyone can see this? Yeah, it's looking good. Great. So we're going to just start with jumping right into uh, the public realm, the urban environment. The, the exhibition space, you could say, uh, for most of our work. And really what gets us excited and what gets drives our curiosity in imagining how art might activate or engage or question uh, how we experience, how we see, how we access uh, our shared public spaces. This is uh, one of our works in a subway station in Toronto. It's called Outside the Lines. And it's a kind of uh, artwork that is really maybe, sorry, it's maybe less about 
being immediately recognized even as an artwork and becoming almost part of the texture and environment um, these spaces that people navigate maybe on a daily basis as we see uh, people walking to the bus from the subway or vice versa maybe not even necessarily looking for or expecting to encounter art and maybe not even uh, consciously taking that in sometimes I think for us that's a really interesting aspect of art within the public realm so maybe tied with that is um, you'll see that there's a question in the chat Arden's not actually not asking us that question she's asking that question on our behalf because we do want to know more about you we want to engage with you as an audience we know that you're a talented crowd of people who are starting up your careers in public art um so yeah have you exhibited your work in the public realm do you think what media do you work with yeah i think that's a good way to do uh, and I help qualify you know, when we when we all are thinking and discussing the public realm. Um, for all of us, we have maybe our own ways into considering what that means. Uh, the publics, uh, lar uh, more largely the communities uh, that may uh, or may or may not be represented or have access in these spaces. Um, and we're going to walk through now just some. We could call these back background slides almost, uh, but for us, I think interesting to share um, for all the nice photos that that we always want to have to share on our website and all those things. Like, it, like as we do as artists, we want to get those nice completed photos. Um, the reality is, you know, as we know, there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes work that happens that uh, that the finished. Um, artwork may not really uh, demonstrate. So this is really, I think, some of the most exciting things uh, when we get to really get our hands uh, dirty or uh, stained with paint as we really kind of put together uh, the work. And for us, uh, as we've grown our practice and the scale of the kind of artworks that we work on, um, collaboration becomes more and more important, um, drawing upon uh, different skilled uh, trades that are able to help us uh, work together across different disciplines to realize um, larger scale artworks. You know, sometimes we're working in really some simple, humble materials uh, like clay and plasticine. Uh, our home is often the kind of uh, laboratory and studio workspace. Here, we're seeing this uh, idea translated into an inflatable artwork that actually we have Arden and Belinda lending a hand. This is the first time exhibiting this. And as we'll see when we dive deeper into one of our uh, projects later on, you know, we're always learning, we're always testing, we're always experimenting. Um, for better or for worse, we, we are often working with this kind of beginner's mind, you could say. Um, we're drawn to to trying different things. Uh, and so whether it's a, a different uh, space or site or community uh, to learn from and discover, whether it's based on uh, material or an effect or uh, an exploration of an experience, um, we're always kind of trying to push ourselves a little bit into the unknown. Uh, never really sure at the outset what the uh, finished uh, artwork may become. But I think for us, that's the kind of creative journey of staying um, a little bit uncomfortable throughout the process. Uh, and hopefully things turn out well in the end, but um, we're always kind of learning um, as we go. And this, this is one of our, our artworks that we'll see a little bit later, but working from hand sketching through to computer digital modeling through to um, actual fabrication. Um, and things as uh, as we scale up become more complex in how we 
collaborate and realize these uh, artworks. So we'll include there and maybe shift into our more formal introduction. <laughs> um, Belinda, thank you for, for introducing us at the outset, uh, but for for ourselves, maybe we can just uh, tell, will tell us a little, tell you a little bit more about ourselves. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Alan Webb. Um, my name is Christine Liu. Um, you know, I uh, was born and raised in North York, Toronto, and then um, I'm a second generation Taiwanese Canadian. So my parents emigrated here in the 1970s. And uh, yeah, and I currently work as a public artist in Toronto. And I'm uh, originally born in Oshawa, but I've uh, called Toronto home for um, quite a while. Uh, trained as an architect myself uh, and sort of navigated eventually into the world of public art. Um, we're also educators and uh, carry on uh, teaching uh, uh, concurrently with uh, the artwork that we do. Um, that was an older photo. This was just a much more recent one. Um, it's not sponsored by BMO necessarily, this photo, but it is <laughs> an artwork that we um, collaborated with uh, Steps, actually, and their BMO mural program. So this is um, in, in a new branch in Toronto, and there's our artwork called Tessellated Labyrinths up above. Oops. So maybe what's interesting about this is you know, while we say that we're public artists, our, our clients may be pretty broad. So this is like obviously a more corporate client. We've also done work with municipalities like the city of Toronto, the city of Saskatoon. Um, and we've also worked with like nonprofit organizations such as Steps um, and some others. So, you know, I think part of this, um, I think part of our strategy with this talk is to like really encourage you and to imagine that art can happen through a variety of different ways and a variety of different places and through a variety of different means. So the client end can be in fact yourself, but, or it could be, you know, someone as large and huge as BMO. So we'll, we'll step back in time and this is Toronto Young Street. And I'm not sure this is probably the 1990s, this photo, but we're going back to 2011 for us, and this is really our our first major artwork that we produced out in the public uh, realm. And this is for Nuit Blanche, which is uh, Toronto's annual exhibition of art that happens across the city. Um, and we'll focus on this one just because it's, I think, hopefully relatable in terms of when we're starting out as artists and we're kind of trying to see, you know, how can our work reach uh, bigger audiences or how can it get out um, from the studio or uh, from the exhibition space into these different parts of uh, cities or uh, urban environments. So we, we, we took us, uh, we took a, a, a a stab and said, okay, we're going to propose a project for the the open call for Nuit Blanche. Um, it got turned down. And so we said, okay, we didn't quite make it. We're going to, we're still going to give Sorry, it a open shot. Open call <laughs> being the one that's like a sponsored one where the city will pay you. And I'm also noticing in the shot that uh, at least one or two people have participated in Nuit Blanche in other cities. So that's great. I mean, Nuit Blanche is like a really great starting point where it's like a you know, it's only for one night, so it's like a big push towards a big event, and then it's over. So um, it's a great place to experiment and try new things. And so, yes, and and I think in our once we get into the Q and A with you, we'll have a chance to to learn and talk about your your different uh, areas and and different opportunities that might exist uh, along these lines. But we got turned down, and we said, okay, well, this is there's still another opportunity called independent project. And that's, that is a little more uh, uh, widely available and there, there's no, not a lot of support or budget, but chances are maybe better for a, an artist with very little um, prior experience. So we, we went back and we, we reproposed a project for their independent call. 
and that was accepted and it was um kind of a combination of things that originally started out as as booklandish and it was um some benches made out of books um it kind of uh changed a little bit from there and we'll talk about that but kind of interesting you know when we get into the, these bigger projects um you know we're we're stretching and learning beyond art making now we're needing to be a little bit kind of accounting and we need to be thinking i think as as uh we all do um, wear many hats as an artist to to be able to kind of realize works and so this was way back when and we said okay we're not even sure how much money would be required to produce this thing but we kind of tried to guesstimate and said okay it's maybe twelve hundred and fifty dollars and we had some idea of yeah so I think you know maybe one of the questions that you might have is like an artist starting out is um how do we how do I even make this thing a reality I need money I don't have money um so there are some grants that are available this is um an example of one the Ontario Arts Council Exhibition Assistance Grant it's pretty reasonably we have a kid who's got this someone in the background that also wants to talk so the exhibition assistance grant is um a pretty uh great one it helps um um you know help you to actually exhibit your space in uh, work in a space and that one um gets offered pretty frequently and um, we know many people who've actually been successful with our grant especially in comparison to some of the really huge ones like five or ten thousand this one's pretty attainable you know, and sometimes thinking, trying to branch into your networks or, you know, we were looking at donated items for all these books. It's like Kijiji, like, you know, we got a ton through like Facebook marketplace, like just trying to think of, and, you know, artists are great at being resourceful. And I think that's just one of the things you got to do, especially when you're starting out. Oops. Just click. Oops. There we go. Um, And then our idea of what a budget might be. Um, this one was interesting now that we're revisiting it. In case things get more expensive, contingency plans. Um, decrease scope of work, decrease artist fees. No, please. <laughs> That's not, anyway, these are the things that we learned from. We always want to, um, as, uh, your yourself working artists, you always want to kind of make sure you can um, be paid um, reasonably for your work. And as much as there's a temptation to maybe say, okay, we're running out of uh, funds, we, we'll take a, a cut out of our own fee. That that should not. Uh, we should always want to protect that. And the, the other things might need to be adjusted afterwards. Yeah, and these kind of realities of like just things cost money. Like we had to rent like a truck. And truck rentals actually aren't that cheap. And then that was eating up a bit of our budget. And the just, you know, just trying to forecast, okay, how are we actually going to make this work? Yeah, so ultimately we have a build in some contingency budget as well. So we'll walk quickly through just sort of the making of. We didn't have a studio at the time. So this is kind of how do we repurpose our, our living space Um how do we work with um, easy to work with materials, kind of going to Home Depot, getting things pre-cut for these benches. Uh, amazingly, once you start asking for things like books and records, um, you kind of almost get overwhelmed with opportunities. Uh, and people also get excited about um, kind of being part of uh, something like this, like an artwork. And they say, oh, this sounds really cool. You're doing a Nuit Blanche project. We'd love to help you out. Um, also drawing upon friends. So we would have these kind of making sessions and order in, take out and say, okay, we're just going to run this hot glue gun all afternoon and see how many of these um, little stools made out of old film canisters we can produce. Uh, the truck's there. We got to load everything out, take it uh, out onto the street. Um, there's also in these things like a festival, right? There's a kind of deadline, a timeline ticking, uh, last minute adjustments, the glues drawing. Uh, the, the people are already there as we're, as we're setting it out. Um, 
interestingly, you know, people started engaging with it again as soon as it um, arrived out on the street, wondering, hey, is this some kind of book sale, a record sale, what's happening? Um, and then the the event officially started at 7 p.m. Um, you know, thinking about why for us this is an interesting one um, to consider, it's that, you know, we were very naive, I could say, uh, in retrospect, this again, our first time really trying to put work out in the public realm. And, and we had a sort of idea of what it would, uh, what that experience would be. But inevitably, um, once that work leaves your hands, it becomes shared with everybody. And all these interesting things that we never anticipated happened. Uh, people uh, rearranging and stacking things. Um, the kind of cross uh, experience of of different ages and generations is really lovely. Uh, at a certain point, not really what we wanted, but people started taking the records out and flinging them like frisbees. And so, uh, some of these safety measures that we might not have thought about um, are again those learning experiences. Uh, and then, you know, something like this, we had so much help from so many different people, uh, and so really grasping the, the the and with gratitude that kind of collaboration and that uh, all these types of projects require and kind of circling back to really express that um, to everyone that, that took part as well okay and then our next project is well our next project we will briefly switch over to our website just because we want to show off our newly designed website, which we wanted to make sure was ready for, for you today. Um, we'll share one project that uh, I think is interesting to talk about just because um, this will touch on the, uh, the possibilities of an artist's residency. So I know um, a lot of us as we're, we're struggling to find time to make art, um, as we're busy with our uh, with our lives and livelihoods, um, if you've had an maybe this could be a a chat question. Has anyone had the opportunity to participate in an artist residency? Um, for us, um, we had that opportunity. Uh, maybe a, this was five years after that Nuit Blanche start, and it was really an amazing kind of way to expand the way we thought about the work that we did, um, really kind of free of distractions and having uh, a really intense period to develop. Let's run the studio. Yeah, I guess we had a lot of challenges but I think it was great to be back Oops. here again and to really stand there in front of oh. <laughs> sharing. Sorry about that. Let's try sharing that again. Um, share. Yeah. Okay. Let's not go full screen. To the site and say, okay, well, it's going to be very difficult to execute the project the way we imagined it back in Toronto. But now that we're here and we're standing here, what can we do to make it more achievable? So I think that was one of our challenges, and I think it I think it worked out very well. The project I worked on is called A Veil of Scaffgrass. Um, this project is sited uh, in the forest beside the bridge um, that leads into this new development area that where they cut down a part of the forest and it created this new um, kind of uh, water stormwater area. So we prepared and we made a lot of items back in Toronto and then when we came here we discovered a little bit more complicated than we thought that we could manage in just a few days so we decided to make some adjustments anymore we pulled it off the bridge and so it's just in front of the bridge and it uses these existing trees to support the artwork the artwork consists of 343 strands of bamboo, bamboo and metal bolts, and the, um, the form is derived from the 
physical um, appearance of the scav grass uh, plant. So the this as as we described in the the project description, the scav grass has this very interesting quality. Besides being kind of prehistoric plant, it's been around for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, we we didn't realize um, as visitors to Denmark, but it, it's a very a unique species here and, and protected as a special plant. And the fact that it's protected allowed uh, a certain area within the forest to be protected against further new development. So that boundary that this bridge sits on is, is kind of the edge of the protected zone where the scott grass is, is growing. Hopefully, um, it makes people think as they pass this this border, and, and we've seen people walking and on bicycles, and because the, the artwork hangs a little bit low, it forces people to slow down and, and look up and kind of consider, oh, this is something different. It's not. Uh, business as usual. It's not just a playground or recreation space. There is something different happening and maybe once their attention is in a different space, they see the other artworks and slow down a bit as well as mm -hmm. they go through the forest. I think the other interesting thing is that when you go um, approach the piece, you're actually in the forest, you're in sort of a natural environment, and you come across the art piece, which is suspended, so it's suspended from these cables, and it's kind of hanging down, and it has some metal pieces, so it's distinctly like a man-made object, and then it acts as a transition, and then you go into this other landscape where you can ride your bike on the new path, and you can see this new river and the new pond, and that is also another kind of man-made landscape. So I think it's important that it kind of, I mean, the transition is already very dramatic, but this piece forces kind of another consideration of it. Other times when we've stood there and watched um, people pass through, you know, people on their bikes will have to like duck down a little bit lower when they're going through, you know, one bike rider kind of hit the piece and, it, and some of the metal pieces hit his helmet and he was kind of surprised. And I think, you know, it might have been a little bit uncomfortable, but I think it's important to say, okay, well, you know, something different is happening here. Let's kind of change that typical kind of physical transition into something else. And it's been also nice to see other people who come through the park just kind of pause and look at it, you know, before they continue on their way. Because the piece is interesting in terms of how it because um, in terms of the other senses, so um, because there's so many different strands and this site is just at a certain point where the wind really kind of funnels from this big open space into the forest. So all these little strands are kind of moving and because they're hollow bamboo pieces, it has this very kind of soft um, twinkling kind of water-like sound. And then the other nice thing is that these metal bolts or nuts in between the um, bamboo pieces also really um, reflect the light. So there's all these little like bright spots in the sky. So I think those things in combination kind of work very well to kind of create this different type of space before you move before somewhere else. I don't think we imagined that this bridge would become an actual usable, as usable as it is where people do use it as that transportation, but it is, yeah, it is interesting because it is a kind of gateway between different worlds in a way, especially now with. Okay, well, we'll stop there. I think that gives us kind of a, um, in, insight into one of our projects that we were able to complete on an artist residency. Uh, we had the opportunity to go to Denmark for, and I think there's some really interesting um, notes in the chat from everybody. 
And maybe we'll quickly conclude with walking through our last few slides, and then we can get to the questions. I think that's going to be the most exciting part. Uh, so, you know, we've been talking about a couple of projects and, you know, the, the challenges thinking about what's uh, maybe what's most interesting in discussing for uh, our, our group today. Um, but it's helpful, you know, some things that we were learning from our mistakes, some of our early projects. We didn't have a, a good photograph even. This is one of our favorite projects, our first one. And our, in our memory, it looks amazing, but we never really got some good photos or good video. So one of the first things we learned is uh, we have to get some really good photos. And yeah, so my recommendation here is actually like, you may be a very good photographer. Like I'm a good photographer, Alan's a good photographer, but you're just so wrapped up in like getting the piece done that you're just gonna forget to pull out the camera and do it, or you might be exhausted, or you might be just saying hi to your friends and family you've come to see it, and you're just like, you can't concentrate on that. Plus the hinky thing is like, if a, a colleague of yours does it, or like someone else takes the photograph, they'll see it in different ways than you. They see it for the first time, they might notice cool things, and I think that's a really great opportunity. So get good documentation, because that's super valuable, because you're still building your portfolio, you need to submit photographs of your work for applications and like residencies, all that stuff. So it's super important. Yeah. I mean, as we as we as we were learning, yeah, the portfolio becomes so important for these kind of public art applications. And if the only thing we have is a not great photo of a project, then we're sort of uh yeah. It, we learned from that. <laughs> so these, we did hire some. We actually, I think that we had two different photographers mm -hmm. do this one. So then, you know, it's like at a different level, which is great. Like, and even that previous project we showed, we actually don't show it in our, we don't use it in our submissions because the photographs are so poor. And we received feedback from juries that have said, your photographs are poor. We can't tell what it is. And it's like, if you have bad photographs of something, it might mean that you have bad artwork, even though the artwork is great. So, you know, oh, this is another thing. It's like, when you do applications, you can often get feedback from jury members. So, you know, even if you get the rejection or actually particularly if you get a rejection, just email them and be like, okay, well, thanks anyways. You know, I really enjoyed, you know, the opportunity. Do you have any feedback? And they might, and they might not, but you know, you've put effort into it to like put it together. The least they can do is like offer you some input because often you're putting together your application for free. It's like, okay, well, I did that. At least um, give me some information here. What can I do better? Yep. And the more, majority of the time you're going to be unsuccessful. We're uh, majority oh, of the time we are unsuccessful and then all, all these calls, but you have to try. Um, and, you know, actually, that's a good point, because I know some artists will say, apply for everything, just like, go, 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 do what you can, whatever gets excited, just do it. I think, you know, if you have like a part time job, or if you're like taking care of a kid or your grandparents or something, you do not have time to apply for everything. And the reality is, so maybe you just be choosy and you say, okay, mm, I can't go for that. Like, maybe I'll just do like five this year or 10 this year like be realistic because a kind of crappy application just like it, it's not going to get you very far whereas then you just kind of wasted your time whereas if there's like a good application you spent a lot of time on it you're excited about the idea then that um, can get you much further so a uh, different opinions about this one but take it as you wish yeah and we'll just get through some of these of our one our first uh, project outside of our uh, Ontario. This is in Edmonton, um, Edmonton Valley Zoo Animal Family, which was uh, kind of a way to uh, introduce children to the animals inside. And then the beautiful uh, Lucy, the elephant that's there, uh, kind of a highlight. Um, I don't know that we'll have a lot of time to talk about our project for Lawrence Heights. This is maybe interesting to to mention when we're, as Christine said, you know, sometimes we should probably be selective about how much 
you know, we all have a limited amount of time to devote to things like calls. Um, this one we got really excited about for Lawrence Heights in Toronto. Uh, it's an interesting community in transition and there's a new development and, and a park there. Uh, so we really went, we really went um, kind of all, all out in this and ultimately not successful. Um, but we, we had some great chats with community groups and we invested a lot of time in, in creating some of the visuals for that. And, you know, even if you're developing a, a public artwork that doesn't really go anywhere beyond um, the concept stage, there's still value uh, down the road in that you can uh, share this and talk about it in, in future applications. Maybe lastly, um, I know I all I know you're all doing art and then you know how do we how are some of these things that we enter the world of public art and this will be our chat but the Kimbo is one of those really helpful resources um, yeah I mean like look for those opportunities Akimbo is kind of one of the more like official ones if you will but I think you know I think some of you are already like noting things like you've done stuff at cafes or like, you know, a mural on the side of a building, you might have like a family member that knows that person. I think these opportunities can happen in a variety of different ways. And like, you know, again, that's one of those things of being an artist. You just got to put on many different hats and try to make things happen. So, um, yeah, maybe um, I know that Belinda and Arden are still around. And I think this is maybe a good chance to maybe transition to some questions and answers. Although I see Akil has a comment here. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, that person writes, thank <laughs> you, Christine, for vocalizing the idea of being choosy about applications. It takes time, energy, and resources to apply for things on a consistent basis. And it's especially important to help artists from equity-seeking communities for those who have a part-time job or full-time job to pay the bills to understand what's realistic. Yeah, it's hard. Like. Yeah, I mean, we have bills to pay, and it's just like, I cannot put in 10 hours to do this application. So, um, yeah, there's a reality to it, which is very challenging. But, you know, organizations like STEPS is actually really great in understanding the challenges of equity-seeking groups, and that there are actually way more calls for diverse groups now, which is so exciting, because it just, you know, even like, three years ago, it wasn't really the case. So you guys are already great at like trying, at finding these opportunities and just keep looking for them consistently. I know that Steps has a really good like newsletter and they have like, they really highlight those opportunities as well. Thank you. Yeah, I saw a lot of really great contributions to your two poll questions as well. Um, but I think we can probably just like jump into questions. I already see another one here. Um, what did you wish you knew about making public art? For example, you mentioned under budgeting. It's a good one. Uh, so many things. Um, actually, there's one thing where like Al and I both have a background in architecture. So this kind of with the kind of pieces that are out to the public round, like beside the sidewalk and stuff. Um, and there isn't like a security guard and it's supposed to be there for years and years and years. That's actually a really challenging thing for beginning public artists to wrap their heads around because you can't have like a paper mache sculpture outside that's gonna last for 20 years, right? So the kind of materials and the realities of like how things can be constructed is actually a pretty, pretty big challenge for a lot of artists starting out. Um, and and still, and still. We're, we're still learning and working through those because um and there's a great question uh from hamid uh, there but the, the the question about you know materials a lot of the re the reality is um once you once your work is out there and especially if it's outdoors um that really kind of narrows down unfortunately the the range of materials uh, we can use you know it's it's typically metal or uh, stone or maybe some kinds of woods uh, some variations within those but um, you know most of the time these things the 
the idea is that it's going to last for 20 years plus. It's It has mm -hmm. to be very safe. It can't be um, da uh, damaged. It's got to withstand extreme uh, heat and cold and all those things. So it's, yeah, it is really um, this whole other level of, of um, consideration that, that comes into play. And maybe some other things like that you need to know if you're doing public art. Um, you might have to work with people that um, that you may not be familiar with, like structural engineers, um, especially if it needs like underground support or if it just needs to be able to, you know, stand up. Um, so you may have to engage with someone like that, that sort of professional. Um, Alan showed at the very beginning some photographs of like us standing at our metal fabricator's shop. So we do not... Um, uh, you know, we still like our studio is still in our home. So we don't have the space or resources or means to like fabricate huge metal sculptures. We work with a metal fabricator. We work with like, we worked with our bronze fabricator. We've worked with like carpenters. Um, we've managed to create like a pretty good network of really talented, wonderful people who make things. And um, you know, it's, it's challenging, right? Cause you may have like a vision that you may have started with, like with, we had some models we showed you with like pipe cleaners. It's like, okay, this is a pipe cleaner model we made and we need, or we have a computer model and we want to make it to reality. So you have to find like the people who are really willing to like get into that challenge with you. Cause it is quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that network kind of has grown organically over time, but it's very slow to um to find the people that that you uh anyway <laughs> that we can have those good working relationships with um, because not everyone is is going to be open to experimenting with with artists uh, if it's not kind of the the work that they're used to doing so it's yeah, it's yeah. Challenging. But there's so many amazing questions we'll have to. Well, maybe just tying yeah. into Daisy's question, like, you know, how do you even find these people? Um, uh, would you, actually, right now this week, if you're in the Toronto area, it's the Design, oh my goodness, Design TO Festival. And they have a lot of events where you can meet artists or go to like talks and stuff. And it's that networking thing that some people hate doing, but sometimes it's really important to do and just say like, hey, I really liked that artwork. I'm really interested in that material or like how, like who or how. Sometimes we've, I don't know, we've established a network, but I don't know. I feel like maybe even over Instagram, we've like sent messages. Wow, we really love that. What is it? Like, how did you do that? Or we'll just do internet research or we'll ask friends and friends um you know because I feel like it's also a challenging industry and I feel like if people um kind of want to share their knowledge and I don't know there's a limited um kind of ball of work that everyone kind of wants to get in on so that's other another way yeah maybe to shift gears oh. again so many great questions maybe for An Andrea a um oh. mental health and wellness you know, super um, important. You know, we work together, which is probably not a good idea for mental health and wellness. But uh -huh. sometimes, sometimes it works um, well in that favor of that. Okay, we're you know we understand that what we're collectively um, going through. Um, but you know, it. I think it's really having the the right people around you that are kind of supportive of, of what you're trying uh what you're trying to do uh you know not critical uh of, of things that you know because not, not everything's going to work out um you know we some of our that ttc artwork that we um shared the videos of at, at the outset when it was first unveiled some pretty some pretty negative uh, uh -huh online trolls uh came coming out of the the internet woodwork to say you know why why is this money getting spent on this and this is something that is part of that discourse of public art there's always kind of the the haters that will say well why why should anyone pay for art or why should the public pay etc cetera, etc cetera. um yeah no you know it's 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 that uh part of the challenge of just um being confident and staying true to 
to what you feel is important and having the the people around you that are uh, that accept that and support you in, in, in your journey um and then i'm noting kara i believe it's kara mm -hmm. uh maybe a cheesy question but how do you define success as artists um that's a hard one i mean for me i don't know for me it's kind of like just not even evaluating our own work just like going around the city and coming across a piece and you're just like oh that's awesome i don't know and i don't know how to really maybe it might shift my perspective about um my the way that I experience a space or maybe the way that i understand like a history of a place or I don't know it can be it can be small because I because we know how hard it can be to ex like execute really great public art and so if I feel like oh someone's trying to do something really amazing and they put like a great effort and like they're kind of going somewhere and they're really challenging the norms and I say I think they're doing a good job yeah and I, I might have a, sl a sl okay, yeah, different yeah, clearly. angle on it um for my it's <laughs> it's um it's just feeling maybe that that you've been that you've been heard or that you're that you've reached someone you know and I think in some ways that's probably what what draws us to expressing ourselves creatively through through art to a certain extent maybe it's it could be as simple as you know when you have an exhibition and and you have an artwork and someone uh, is there and you can talk about it with them. Um, in some ways, it's the same exchange, even at a large scale artwork. It's that, oh, someone is there. Um, I don't know. I think that's the best part is, is kind of um, seeing how people experience it or, or having them share their experience of, of what you had um, put out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also want to remind anyone if they want to unmute and ask a question as well, feel free to just like raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, but thank you for all these questions. There's another one from Hamdi. Um, additionally, how do you address safety concerns when creating your sculptures? For instance, how do you ensure that they are not hazardous, especially if they are climbable or could potentially be dangerous in some way? Yeah, there's a there's a reality there. I mean, especially because like you're not going to be standing beside the the artwork and say don't do that the entire time. Um, there's uh because public artwork can sometimes veer into the realm, a uh, different realms. The sometimes it can be the Ontario Building Code can apply to artwork, which can be kind of frustrating, at least for works in Ontario. So there are regulations about you know, how strong it has to be. So maybe your structural engineer gets involved or restrictions about, um, uh, gee, like how close elements can be together. So like you don't get squished by it or something. I don't, yeah. I think this is where you might get like an architect involved or a structural engineer involved. Or start reading the Ontario Building Code, which is not a lot of fun. Um yeah it is and it's funny to again that ttc artwork um a lot of uh, a, lot, a lot of comments um on the on the client side ar around safety um understandably so uh but it's it's interesting because there would be on the subway platform a bench that in theory someone could climb and, and jump off and all uh do those um dangerous things but when it's uh, a new thing introduced, then all of a sudden people are going to uh, look at it much, much more closely. So uh, I guess that's another part of, of public art is it, it's often going to have a, a really uh, a lot of scrutiny around um, safety, among uh, other things. Um, yeah. Um, a question yeah. about the, the inflatable piece. How long did that stay up for? <laughs> Also, great learning experience, as as uh, our friends of Steps um, can share as well. That was the first time for us creating something uh, with with this sort of inflatable material, and it was really it was really amazing to um, to work with. Um, yeah, it 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 
it's funny, you know, that some of the some of these things come down to oh, the ground was so dry and hard. Um, there's a plan for staking all these things in, but when it comes down to, you know, <laughs> uh, installing on site, if the if the ground is hard as concrete, then then there's a sort of plan B that needs to to happen. So yeah, these are great for us. Again, we're we're always trying new things, new materials. We learned um, from some of those challenges. So uh, the next time we uh, help install that, we'll have uh, plan B and C for all these, uh, again, these contingencies, which uh, really kind of get amplified when work gets out, uh, let's say, out of the studio, out of the gallery. There's all these unknowns that that we try and try to account for. Mm -hmm. well, there's uh, a as architects, why did you choose to go into public art? Um, that's a tough, well, it's not a tough question. I think, um, you know, like I still really enjoy architecture. I still think it's amazing. There's something amazing though about public art and you can be much more expressive with public art. You can do a wider variety of things with public art. Um, there's some really great opportunities with like engagement and stuff with public art that I think is really um, compelling these days. Um, the challenging thing with architecture is it may take like five, 10 years for like a building to like manifest itself. Whereas like say something for Nuit Blanche, you might be working on it for a few months and it's up for like a, a night and then it's down. Like, so the opportunity for experimentation and like designing more quickly and seeing the results of it is much um it's pretty exciting I think as well so it's kind of that timeline thing but also maybe being more expressive with public art is also compelling yeah let's see more chat oh Belinda yes no worries. Yeah, there's another question from Andrea. Is there a lot of legal things you have to learn or be aware about when doing public art? Kind of went over this a little bit, but if you wanted to elaborate. Uh, yeah. Maybe one other thing I'll add is uh, you should have a contract. <laughs> it's kind of a boring thing. Um, we actually do have a lawyer who reviews some of our contracts. Um, and a contract is good because it protects both you and your client, say the, and you know, in some cases it's maybe not even required if it's like a artwork being hung on a wall, but if it's kind of more permanent stuff or stuff that's out in the public realm, you might want to have a contract. Um, that's kind of one of the legal things. Yeah, I mean, we didn't really get uh, into the, the legal world until, you know, a, a few years in, but yes, now having, someone we trust as a lawyer to look at things has been really helpful it's saved our our bacon and uh in at least one case uh, so it was definitely worth it but yeah just the idea of um having a written agreement even with people you're you're working with like uh you're you're working with let's say a uh a mural painter or a foundry or whatever for the first time it's it's nice even if it's just an email to say okay we're going to produce this for $200 and you're going to have it done by August 31st. And so at least everyone's kind of on the same page with expectations because, um, yeah, things, things sometimes, um, often go sideways as, as, uh, projects go on. So having, yeah. And maybe some of that is really helpful tied to that is insurance and some projects will actually like municipalities will require that you hold insurance and that's like a whole other world that mm. um you know if someone injures themselves or themselves will like um you know engaging with your artwork that might be a thing yeah it can it can get a bit tricky um there's destiny here i like that you mentioned everyday objects can present hazards I think the installations being a new piece in the space lends people to think of new ways to engage with the object, whereas everyday objects have pre-imposed pre scripts of engagement. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. When we, we first started, we were working with super tiny budgets. We would just cruise the aisles of Home Depot 
and just like kind of look for like cheap things and then try to imagine like reconstituting them into different things and like playing around. Yeah. We've gone to Dollarama. We've done it, you know. Still do sometimes. Yeah, still goes Dollarama sometimes. Yep. The last question that was asked will be the last one we'll take. We'll take these last few, just being mindful of time. But yeah, thanks everyone. Um, Manny asked, how are you paid out when participating in New Wave Blanche, for example? Are you compensated all at once for your artist fees, materials, accommodations, or is it paid out in sections to help cover costs beforehand? I understand that cost up front can often be the biggest obstacle for a lot of artists nowadays. It's a good question. Yeah, I think um, for small projects, when I say small, I'm going to say like $5,000 or $10,000 and under, you're probably going to be paid at the end after the piece is installed. Um, for bigger projects, um, you might be paid out at uh, different milestones. You We're working on a project now where we're um, we'll get paid like 25% once the drawings are complete. We'll get paid another 25% once 50% of it is like made in a shop and then we'll get paid like at like kind of milestones, if you will. But you're right that the that the upfront cost can be a barrier. I think that's it's there's a reality in that, especially if you're starting out. So I don't know yeah, if you can add. Uh no, it is a difficult position. And so, you know, sometimes if if it's a project that you could get, uh, let's say, donated materials and in kind and uh, or like we reached out to the BIA or Business Improvement Association that could um, get some money uh, for this project. So, yes, the more that you can um, take that risk out of it uh, for yourself, that you're not left kind of fronting uh project costs the better but it is it is tricky because it's often the reverse where you're getting paid at the end uh, um there is another question since you have that background in architecture what are some things you have done or want to do to express your artistry and push the limits of how more permanent structures like buildings can be manifested either in building new spaces or in maintaining updating existing spaces yeah that's, that's a really good <laughs> I, th I think there's it, maybe that speaks to kind of the the conventions of dividing things by discipline. So, you know, there's often, you know, the architect does this and the artist does that and and they're two separate things um, or the engineer or whoever, the landscape. Um, yeah, I think the more that those boundaries can be blurred, um, the more interesting outcomes can happen. So whether it's the artist that gets into having some uh, capacity to, to shape those things or or vice versa and I think there's mm -hmm. interesting avenues there yeah it's kind of interesting like we do um there's some questions about like materiality earlier it's like yeah we do use some materials that you just see on buildings because they're resilient and they will last a long time so we use metals pretty frequently but we try to use or at least in some cases use them in different ways like that subway station one like it's basically based upon like a handrail like it's kind of the same it is literally the same size too but we're trying to reimagine that material in different ways and that's why it takes on those cool shapes um you know maybe this is not exactly answering the question but like I think something like our practice has evolved to be more about community engagement and chatting with people and seeing how engagement can impact um, the results uh, or like how public artwork gets done. Something that I'm looking more towards, and this is where I guess an inspiration from architecture is like they are looking, architects are looking much more to like the environmental effects and minimizing their kind of carbon footprint of buildings. And I've been starting to think about how that's possible with artwork as well um, potentially in materiality or in the way it's fabricated um you know we you know we, we try to be in, inspired by a whole bunch of things we go to art galleries all the time we like i don't know we just like walk around cities and like try to learn things all the time so we get inspiration from everywhere yeah. mm -hmm. 
Amazing. You kind of also answered someone's question about thinking about the Oh, hey, yeah, we're trying. Great. So I'm glad you already touched on that. Um, but yeah, last question. How do you dispose of ephemeral artwork? <laughs> Yeah, well, this this goes to the sustainability question, and it's an interesting one because um, you'll probably find a lot of public art calls are still catching up with how sustainability works in relation to public art. So, uh, for us, we we see it needs a, a budget um, that says, you know, if you're gonna, we need to have funding to pay for more sustainable practices or build it that in, but. The ephemeral artworks, yeah, I think it, it's it's on us as artists to think about the life cycle and say, okay, this material that, that is used for this temporary thing, we have an idea of how it's going to get reused or repurposed or how it can um, be uh, captured in, in the recycling stream or, or biodegradable. Yeah, like we did, um, we have friends who are artists too, and we're just like, oh, there was a point we were holding our basement had a lot of just stuff kind of sitting there for a while. Um, and then we had like a lot of these like string lights that we weren't using for a while. And then we realized we weren't going to use them. And then we gave them to another artist and they totally just used it. There's another project we did in the city of Mississauga that used like that wood snow fencing. It was a, and we actually intentionally used that material because we wanted to give the city of Mississauga back the material so that their parks maintenance people could like use it so we were like actually it's probably the best example of like kind of a really sustainable practice sometimes we just give i don't know we had like all these leftover bolts nuts and bolts from a project we're going to give it to our kids school because they want to do like a a stem project we're like oh my god take it so um sometimes we pass things off through kijiji and you know friends need stuff yeah we try Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time, but this has been amazing. i um, super excited to be hosting this Create Space Public Art Forum. Um, it brings together over 50 participants from across Canada and fosters connections, providing emerging equity-seeking artists with the skills, relationships, and supports needed to develop their art practices. We also talked about residencies, which is great because we have our upcoming 2024 Create Space Public Art Residency um, called Our Artists Out Right Now, which a lot of you are already aware of. Um, I'm also dropping the link to the application to that um, in the chat as well. And I encourage all of you to share that and also to apply. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Christine and Alan, for your knowledge and for um, everything you shared today. Thank you, Arden, on the back end for your support. And thank you so much, Christina, for the ASL interpretation. Um, and thank all of you for all of your contributions and thoughts and questions. Um, yeah, it's been an honor and also thanking our funder, Canadian Heritage. Um, but yeah, we appreciate this. And yeah, I hope everyone has a great rest of their afternoon um, wherever you're joining from. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.